I'm Tim <laughs> Mack. I am here with Grace Galu and Baba Israel. And uh, they're, we're part of uh, the HARP program at the Hero Arts Center. And I'm just interviewing a lot of the HARP artists um, and asking them about their projects. And thanks for joining us. Uh, Thank you. So, <laughs> so you two, why don't you tell us about your project first and uh, then we can get into details. Okay. Sure, I'll jump in and just give a little context and then pass it to my collaborator, Gracie. Uh, Grace Galu in the house, <laughs> writer and composer of the piece. Um, so I wanted, yeah, so I wanted to, the piece began, um, there's a book called Smoke Signals written by an author named Martin Lee. And this book is the social cultural history of cannabis. And I was uh, in touch with Martin when I was making my last piece, The Spinning Wheel, which was about my late father, Steve Ben Israel, who was a member of the Living Theater. And I'd gotten in touch with Martin and you know he was a, a longtime friend of my dad's and he turned me onto this book that he had written. And it just, it's a book that explores the history of cannabis, um, but through cultural figures, political movements, social movements. Um, and, and when I read the book, I just started to dream of it as a performance because there were so many rich stories, whether it was, you know, cannabis and its connection to the beat generation and Allen Ginsberg or cannabis and the connection to the jazz age and to Louis Armstrong or Ella Fitzgerald or Bob Marley and reggae culture or hip hop culture and Cypress Hill and, um, you know, or the Mexican revolution or, you know, uh, cannabis coming uh, to the Americas on slave ships, actually. That's one of the ways that it got here. It, it's not indigenous to this part of the world. And one of the ways that it came to the Americas was actually on as part of the Middle Passage. Um, you know, so there was just so many, you know, and then there was also exploration of the, the racist roots of prohibition and, and why the plant was made illegal in the first place. And you know, the first place it was made illegal was in El Paso, Texas in around 1913. And it was a way of criminalizing Mexicans. Um, who were and and you know and had a lot to do with the the, the Mexican Revolution and Mexi Mexicans coming into America and and the border and you know it just felt like it it there was so much uh, rich material and so much rich music that was being referenced and so many iconic cultural figures and then lesser known people like Dennis Perone who was a, an incredible AIDS activist in the Bay Area um, and you know one of the the first catalysts for cannabis becoming medically legal was be in a response to the AIDS uh, epidemic. Um, because the munchies were literally saving people's lives. Um, and, you know, so there, you know, and then Brownie Mary, who, you know, Grace does a beautiful song in the piece. Um, oh, and, really? Yeah, it's a beautiful song about, about, about this uh, grandmother <laughs> named Brownie Mary, who was this woman in her late 70s who would make marijuana brownies and bring them to AIDS patients um, and sneak them into there. And she was in, arrested many times and you know, there was just all this activism and spirit and, and, and environments. And, and so I just felt like this is a show. There's a show here. There's a story to be told. This book should come to life. Um, I started to um, write for the, you know, write songs and lyrics and poems and raps. And I knew that I didn't want this just to be a, a solo piece. I, this is like too big a story. And I knew that I wanted song to drive the show um, and not just what I do, which is rap and poetry that I really wanted melody and, and all these beautiful genres from you know, old school jazz to, to soul and rock and hip hop and reggae to, to come to life. And so I was looking for a collaborator to, to be a composer and to be a song, uh, to really bring the songs to life. And, and Grace is someone that I had collaborated with in the past on a previous uh, project and was someone who was really connected to other people in, in, in our band. And, Grace came into the studio on one wintry night and I, I gave her some lyrics and she just made magic happen. And oh. I, just, I just was blown away by what she did and how she really brought these words, uh, just emotion and vitality through her voice and her, and then as we, and, I, and we just started to collaborate. And what I learned about Grace was that she could use her voice to really invoke any time period. Um, and that she had a very unique skill as a singer and as a composer to to really make make you time travel through song and through voice. And and so then Grace ended up becoming part of our, our band and joining our band. And we've been working on this project for a bunch of years. And uh, I'm going to pass it to Grace to add your thoughts. <laughs> thank you, Bob. And thank you for bringing up my skills and how talented you think I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> now, can I just uh, say, you really are. I mean, you have an extraordinary range. You, thank you. You, you basically do anything with your voice. And so yeah, just, I'll just throw, I'll throw a little of that too. <laughs> Ooh, thank you. Um, and on that note, I'd like to say, I do feel like this project uniquely suits my talents and my creative sort of desires to go, to travel through time, bring in different voices, different styles, sort of do um, caricatures in, the, in a way of what the voices were to me and like sort of amplify those sounds um, and bring soundscape into the play in a way that has a, uh, a more like film-like feel. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's been wonderful to do that. And also as a cannabis user for recreation and for medicinal purposes. And I think, you know, as Baba says, all, all reasons are medicinal. Um, it's, it's so important to me. It's so important. Yeah. And I feel very just, I feel so indebted to the project and also invested in the project in that it's telling my own story. And I'm so grateful that you know we have a platform for it because before I just felt so much shame. Um, so yeah, I, and what and, and that like, what is that? What is that process of releasing that shame and and grabbing hold of a of um, what the culture calls shameful and saying and flipping it? What is that process for you too? Oh, it's been painful. <laughs> <laughs> and it's looked, it's looked, at, uh, it's arrived in different ways. You know, Baba and I have had to like sort out some things around race and misogyny as the project was predominantly male for a, a while. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had to sort out sort of like, how was I going to appear in this project as Grace and not as like a, a fetishized black woman pot leaf, you know, which I see a lot mm -hmm. too. Um, so we're right. still trying to, suss that out and yeah. it's it's you know bringing in urban bush women i think the conversation has to become larger and we can even sort of i didn't know that you're working with urban bush women yes yes yeah we're working oh. with some with, with several members of urban bush women it's oh wonderful yeah. That my love. So. yeah 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 i mean i think it's interesting i mean just to pick up i think grace and i grew up with very different experiences around cannabis i grew up in a in a cannabis family and you know in the living theater kind of community where cannabis was like if you weren't smoking you were kind of odd you know, <laughs> you know? and you know, I, you know I i grew up you know in passover ceremonies with a hundred artists and you know Allen Ginsberg poetry being wove, woven into the haggadah and people passing you know the the manischewitz wine and joints around and I think Grace had a very different history, but I think I still had a lot of internalized shame. I, you know, I work a lot in schools and work with young people and like cannabis has been so demonized and so shamed and there's been, but, and you know, but what Grace mentions around race is so powerful and important to explore too, because, you know, my experience is very different than hers. Uh, and, you know, just in general, that's the truth. Like, you know, in New York for many years, the statistics were 90% of cannabis arrests in the city were, were black and brown folks. You know, and that was a pretty consistent data point, you know. Right. Yeah, and it's probably a little premature, the question, because you haven't actually, you've done workshops at the show, but you haven't presented the, um, the premiere, right? Is that correct? Not um, so, so when that happens, we should revisit this conversation to see <laughs> if something's flipped uh, from the perspective, you know. Um, with the audience. Do, uh, uh, for the workshops, have you found that it's uh, primarily people that are kind of on board with uh, with um, supporting cannabis uh, or have you found it mixed or what, what's the audience for you been like so far as you, as, you, as, you, as you have been developing? Yeah, it's funny. A New York audience is like always gonna be open to cannabis, you know, because like statistically New York audiences just are. And then usually it's our friends and other artists, which, you know, those, those communities really support cannabis. I think the in arguing, if anything, or the sort of confrontations have been around who is more invested in making sure that this is legal and free and that people are unimprisoned and who is just doing this because it's like a fun party thing and who are like the white boys who are making money and then right. who are like the real, you know, fighters, like the real freedom fighters. And to get the both of those groups in the same room and say, okay, it's, you're both okay both are okay, both are fine. And one doesn't take away from the other, but we still have to have these conversations around inequity. Blah, blah, blah. So I feel yeah, yeah. 
that's usually what's happening in the room is like, who is here and for what reason? And are you here just because mm. you watch Cheech and Chong and think it's cute? Or are you here because you're a freedom fighter? And there has been uh -huh. a tension around that, even within the band. Yeah. Like some of the things that the band is wanting to go, like, what? what? <laughs> That's some Cheech and Chong shit. That's some white boy, you know, I can't. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good point. And I, there was actually one organization that I had reached out to who is a cannabis organization. And, you know, I sent them some information. They were like, oh, we don't think this is a fit for us. And. You know, I think it was because they were coming much more from a sort of capitalistic, you know, you know, there's a lot of people from the sort of hedge fund world and the, you know, the sort of startup yeah. world yeah. who are moving into cannabis, you know, and so you have this really strange mix where, as right. Grace mentions, there's been freedom fighters, you know, uh, black, brown and white, you know, across age and gender and sexuality who've been fighting for social equity and, and you know, against mass incarceration. For generations and there's people who've been you know on a psychedelic sort of playful trip both beautiful and crazy and weird and and then there's other people who are really moving into it because of the economic opportunity and i think you know i'm i think i think that's that is one of the tensions that that, that in the room in the room you know um, but i would also say that I, i'm looking forward to when we have a space where the tension is just like should we exist or not like mm -hmm. is it the devil's plant or not we haven't been in that space but that's going to be cool too yeah. Yeah, eventually when you tour you'll get in that space yeah. or even if you like work at any of the you know off-broadway theaters in new york city <laughs> It's true. Audience is going to come and judge you. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, it's it's interesting. We did we we did do some works in progress uh, in legal states, which was interesting. We did we did a performance in Colorado uh, in Telluride, actually, which is a very you know specific part of Colorado. Um, and then we also did a performance in Seattle uh, at a at a very kind of important uh, gathering that happens out there called Seattle Hemp Fest, uh, which is you know, a longstanding cannabis uh, sort of activist performance rally. Um, and then we also did a work in progress on in a dispensary in Northern California. And we were actually did a little residency on this beautiful dispensary called Amazing. Emerald Farms. And that and so there, there people were actually, you know, using cannabis out in the open. And I remember Grace, you pointing this out that there were, you know, there were people there with their families. There was grandparents, there was babies, there was kids, and it was just sort of natural and normal. And like, you know, it, it was, there wasn't a stigma. And that was a very, we were all sort of like in New York, we're so used to being like tense about it, you know? And so that right. was really, that was yeah. kind of inspiring. But, but it was also very white because it was, you know, it was like Northern, it was like really Northern Cali up in Santa Rosa kind of area, you know? Uh -huh. So, but um, yeah, I think, I think I, I'm curious to see, I think, I think that the piece will, um, you know, I'm, I, we do want to get it in front of audiences who are not necessarily, you know, who maybe have misgivings or questions about cannabis. I think, I think there is an opportunity for this piece to create dialogue and to maybe illuminate and challenge misconceptions. Um, you know, Grace and I both have a passion. And how for, do you yeah. balance that? Yeah, well, just how do you balance that, um, that desire to, um, to change people and their attitudes about cannabis and, and to uh, enlighten people about the history of it, while at the same time um, uh, making art, you know? And, and so oh, how, do you, how do you juggle those things? Uh, I mean, I know, that, I know that you do. It's not a question of can you, but, I, but I'm, I'm curious how you do it. Yeah, I feel like overtly trying to change someone's opinion never really works and it creates a, a confrontation where people sort of become stalwarts and just, no, I believe what I believe more. Um, but the associations do change opinions. So, you know, my father never knew that Louis Armstrong was a cannabis user and he's a big Louis Armstrong fan. Having heard the music and then understanding that through that prolific career that man was using cannabis every day did change his association with the plant. So I don't know if it's gonna be a, like a really stark confrontation in the piece. And we've even discussed that. I don't know if it works. I don't know if it works for me. Like that sounds kind of scary. <laughs> Putting myself in an environment with a bunch of people who don't believe in what I believe in and I just like my existence confronts them as, I, uh, I don't mm. know if that's like, yeah. I don't know if that's safe for me. I, I wouldn't go to a concert to listen to music that I hate. So I kind of feel like we can appeal to audiences that like us. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes and if we change anybody's mind, awesome. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, I think, I mean, I one thing show I in like, San Francisco and all these queens show up, you know, and you're just like, oh, family, oh, I can relax. I don't have to work so hard. <laughs> you know, everyone's going to get all the jokes. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, oh. I think maybe that's, maybe that's all I want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think that's a great a, a great point, and I think you know I think there you know I, as the piece develops and we're still finding the form of the piece, like we have you know a lot of songs written, a lot of music composed, a lot of you know beginnings of choreography and movement. But I think in terms of like the the shape of the show, I mean, one of the things that that really inspires me is this, there was this place in San Francisco called the San Francisco Cannabis Buyers Club, and it was an illegal cannabis dispensary hangout, um, you know, started by Dennis Perone and a bunch of his co-conspirators. And it was a, a very, you know, and it was, there was a place called The Island, which was this vegetarian restaurant in San Francisco. And, you know, you, and, and, and you know, the, the, above the restaurant was this illegal dispensary and they, but they were operating completely out in the open and they, they were just sort of challenging the police to take action because they said, this is so immediate. There are so many people dying right now cannabis is literally saving folks with AIDS lives. And so they just sort of created this rebel space. Um, and I think that, you know, and it was a space of healing. And one of the reasons that, you know, Dennis Perone, who is this, was this activist who's passed away now, you know, he, he really had a vision for this space, not to be a place where people just came and got their herb and then left, but, you know, healing is so much about community and not being isolated. And so one of the things that he really had was you know, this has to be a hangout. This has to be a people where come, they come get their medicine, but then they, they spend time together. And so I think uh -huh. I, I sort of feel, I would love for this show to feel like a underground cannabis club in some way, you know, a place where you're coming and you, it is a, it is a sanctuary. You know, we do have a song that's called Sanctuary, you know, uh, which Grace came up with a great sort of- This is our sanctuary, our place where we are free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and so I think I think the piece does want to be a celebration of kind of you know, sort of rebel spaces, sanctuaries, hideouts, yeah. kind of you know, and you know we want we want to sort of feel like we we'll welcome the audience. Like I, there is a big craving for that, and then how we weave in people who might not be into it. I don't know. We'll have to see. I mean, one yeah. You know, one thing that comes but that's in interesting. Yes. I have to yeah. say that that like a song like that does two things. It it invites the audience into a sanctuary, but it also says, "Leave your shit at the door. It's a sanctuary." Right. Yeah. <laughs> it also says, "This is ours. This is our sanctuary." Right. Okay, so you're ours. entering our you're entering our chapel. You're entering our church. Uh -huh. Best behave. This is ours. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, in terms of like the conversation about how do we draw people in that aren't cannabis people, I think it's going to be the people that bring them, right? How does a, ca a non-cannabis person come to this show? Is it someone's mom who's like, oh, I smoked a joint once, but you know, it's not great for health. <laughs> like, who are these people that are on the, the undecideds? I, I find them to be unicorns. I've never really met them. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm curious yeah. about that person who's like, okay, I have these misconceptions about cannabis, but I have a connection to someone who doesn't. I think that's how they come to the show. Otherwise, I have no idea how they get there. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't like <laughs> cannabis. I mean, I do other drugs, but I don't do cannabis. And I, uh, and I, but I would want to come see it just because you guys are so amazing. Right. <laughs> oh, it, sounds so cool. it sounds like a big hang, right? Who doesn't want to hang out and listen to amazing music? So, so I think there's probably that element too. You know? yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I remember one one great moment we had in Colorado is we were we went we went we were like going sledding. You know, we were like had a day off and we we got the band together. We said, let's go sledding. And we're like in this sledding place and we may, we're connecting with a woman there who gives us these beautiful, uh, remember, the, remember the, the red velvet vegan donuts? Oh I'll never God. forget. <laughs> and, and, and then all of a sudden these two older ladies come up to us. They were probably in their seventies and they're like, oh, you guys are doing the cannabis show tonight? We're coming. <laughs> and they were so excited to be coming. And you know, they, it was so sweet. And, and, <laughs> and they were like, you know, and it was like so great to see these two older white ladies like pumped to come to the cannabis show. And I think part of the reason was that, you know, we had advertised we were gonna be doing the Beatles and Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong. And so, you know, I think that there, there was sort of this musical pathway, but then I think also, you know, with, C, with sort of the emergence of CBD and right. the more mainstream reporting on cannabis, I think there is this 
shift and there is this there is a new community out there who's intrigued i mean i just got off the phone with the doctor at my mom's you know i, just, I unfortunately just had to make the difficult choice to put my mom in a nursing home you know and after caring for her for eight years you know and and you know she has dementia and cannabis has been such a part of her, her well-being you know it you know we we started giving her a tincture i mean my mother was a smoker a pot smoker for decades but we started to give her a tincture and you know we saw her behavior just change so much you know and and so i've been really struggling with the fact that you know that i that i can't continue that now that she's in the nursing home but i but i talked to her doctor today and i was very relieved that the doctor was like very open you know and and said mm -hmm. you know i don't know what i can do because there may be legal restrictions but i'm i'm not prude i know that this can be really beneficial for seniors you know let's see what we can do and I don't think that conversation would have gone down like that uh, even two or three years ago. I don't think a doctor wow. in a nursing home would have, would have, you know, had that conversation with me necessarily. And so- You would have had to hunt down the, the specific doctor that would yeah, have. Yeah, exactly. So the fact that just the, the, you know, the doctor at this nursing home was able to have that dialogue with me. And I was, I have to admit, I was nervous to bring it up. I felt like I was going to get in trouble, you know, so, <laughs> you know. You know, oh, it's so you know, it's so, so ridiculous. Are we all adults? I know, I know. <laughs> Why do we carry well, this I, I was nervous about it in the context that we had been giving his mother this cannabis tincture, and she can't really consent. She has dementia, uh, so I was just worried about. Like, I saw a whole Law and Order episode. <laughs> <laughs> We were, it was going to be some weird thing where we were going to be the example of like cannabis persecution. But well, luckily for the like record, that. I've got a healthcare proxy and she's got a medical marijuana card. So oh, we'll for the record. For the record. <laughs> anyway, we're getting interviewed right now, right? What's happening? But that's amazing. <laughs> that's but, exactly what this is what the people want. But, but, um, you know, I think one other, one other area, you know, one other area that I think is really interesting for me, and it, it's there's a song that um, that that I wrote that Grace just brought to life in such a beautiful way. Thank um, you. Is a song song called "No More Drug War," and this is a song that was particularly inspired by a talk that I that I'd seen at in Seattle, Seattle Hempfest, and it was a talk done by veterans. And 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 I you know I've, I I've interviewed some veterans. I've I watched this talk, and you know. Veterans who are suffering with PTSD are tremendously helped by cannabis. Um, it is profound, the level of uh, healing it can, it can have. I mean, other, there's other things happening with MDMA and with psilocybin as well, which are really important. And I think all these conversations about, you know, so-called drugs or ethnogens or plant medicine, it's just very important right now because we're, we're in a mental health crisis. We're in a, you know, we're in a, a, a global pandemic. We're in a, a moment where there's just you know huge opioid abuse, and you know the, the the research shows that when veterans get on cannabis, their opioid usage just drops, and you know and and there there were you know veterans talking about they were on 25 pills and now they're just on cannabis, um, and and there's so many ways that that knocks because so many you know some pharmaceuticals can be really helpful. I'm not going to be dogmatic about that, but some of them can be really debilitative and you know have bad side effects and. And I felt like that was an important story to explore because I mean, veterans are, you know, within American sort of mythology, they are, you know, they are held up in this great regard. But when it comes to access to medicine, in many cases, they are being denied access. And until recently, the VA could not even talk about cannabis. Um, and, and so that, you know, that felt like a, an interesting way to sort of talk to, uh, an audience that that you know that that might be a little bit you know that might be outside of our own sort of world because right. i think veterans yeah. cut across all kinds of different cultures and backgrounds and and political views too um and so i uh, think you know that's yeah. that that's i think quite a quite an important piece and also may, you know brings in along with the playfulness and the and the and the celebration also brings in a sort of emotional depth because it's a song written from the perspective of, of a mother yeah and, and do you have a recording of that song that I do. you can share with us? Or is there another? Yeah, uh, no, wait, I do have a recording. Oh, oh. Yeah. This brought something up for me before you share sure, it. Absolutely. This actually brought up a context around misogyny and like toxic masculinity and how it's not about necessarily not revering um, veterans, but this idea that a strong, good veteran suffers in silence, mm. doesn't need medical care, mm. especially when it comes to mental health. And why would 
a mm. strong, capable veteran, male machismo guy need cannabis. Cannabis is for those like frou-frou hippie people. So I think there's that yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah. you know, that cultural backlash there as well. So something, yeah. just something to think about. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let me see if I can uh, effectively share this. Give me a second. Here. <laughs> let me try to get okay. this ready. Hold on, give me one second. Sure. Okay, here we go. We're going to it. Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Right. Ooh, I look good. You do look good. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I wanna I wanna make sure the sound is is the share sound feature is happening. We get a nice sound. So give me one second. Okay, you guys can see me? Go see great. Here we go. Yes. This country and his land He did his time In Afghanistan Came home and I did my best To make him a list Of things for him to heal Lord knows it's hard for him to feel He's so hurt, paranoid, getting hooked on opioids. He's got a bag full of pills. I swear his soul to kill. I cry and not dreaming of a better life. Maybe he can find himself a wife. Came home with his eyes red. Came home with his eyes red. But I saw my boy smile. I hadn't seen it in a while. It made my eyes tear, so I held him near. He told me he's smoking a reefer. It makes it all a little easier. I never touch the stuff, but I love him, and that's enough. Thrown in jail. I don't have cash for the bail. Now he's locked up in a cell, trapped in hell. I'm praying for his survival.
I didn't watch. <laughs> oh, it was beautiful. Oh, yeah. That's a comeback <laughs> afterwards. It's uh, okay. You're gorgeous. You're gorgeous. And you sound beautiful. Um, and that's Shannon. Did Shannon uh, Judson, did she choreograph that or was it? Yeah, it did, it's actually, yeah, the pri we've, we've been, we've been collaborating with, um, we did a, we did like a, a series of workshop residencies with music and movement. And we worked with um, Camille Brown on a couple uh -huh. of pieces, but that piece actually was uh, choreographed by Shannon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you um, picked it. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously cannabis can be a meditative drug, but it also can be pretty social. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things I see you doing there is, uh, you know, we talked about it earlier that you're, you're, you're creating a hang, you yeah. know, and so the, the audience is kind of wrapped around with the band kind of wrapped around, everyone can kind of see each other and, and be part of that. Is that something you're going to continue? And, and um, assuming that everyone's vaccinated and it's all safe, <laughs> is that? And and then also, how is how is the social aspect of this? Um, how it relates to the drug, but also to your piece and the art that you're making. How is it? Uh, how how is it changing? Because we've all been in isolation. <laughs> I think that's a great question, and you know, <laughs> I love that. No, it's wonderful, and I think it, it builds on a conversation that me and you had a while back when we met in a little uh -huh. coffee shop, uh, you know, on in in uh, near Irving Plaza. Um, and, and you were talking about how when you create a piece, you were saying that like, you know, you'll let the sort of the, the theme sort of help you find the form. Mm -hmm. And I think cannabis yeah. is, is such a social. And so that, that, that partly came out of our conversation that thought of like, what should this, you know, this space be? What should the environment be? And we've done two works in progress. One, we had everybody up on their feet and we had a standing audience and we had a thrust that came right into the audience. And we sort of had more of like a, a dancing audience. And then this time we tried in the round and we really wanted to feel that sense of a cipher and of a ritual where everyone was together. Um, I, think, I think it needs, I, for me, I feel like it, it, we wanna have audience interaction and we wanna have the audience as co-conspirators. We wanna improvise. There'll be you know, songs which are written and chore choreographed and all of that. But I think it does wanna feel like a happening in some way. And so we're, we're, we haven't figured out all those techniques yet, but I definitely want we want it to be a social experience. I think that's important to the piece. And so what, you know, what the final shape takes, we're, we're still finding, but I think that that's, that sense of the audience is witnessing themselves and they are part of the action has always been part of the impulse. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think even more so now, like gathering, I think is gonna you know, have so much meaning. And if someone was talking, I read an article, like the beginning of an article about the roaring twenties and sort of, how that came after the you know the Spanish flu and this this sense of people just wanting nightlife and wanting connection and wanting socialization and so I, I have a feeling that there will be this profound sense and appreciation for human connection and 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 physical proximity and you know so I think that I, I hope that the piece will be a healing space for people post pandemic yeah yeah. I did like it when we had the thrust that came out into the audience because it created like this sense of soul train and I saw everyone doing like their little thing down the thrust and like us bringing up audience members into that but it actually intimidated people and it made it really delineated us from them and so I think the the cypher was better and more natural to like hip-hop more natural to like song rounds and all the spiritual aspects that we wanted to bring in and then also more natural to weed. So I, I think keeping the cipher is good. It's intimidating for me, I think as a performer, when I'm like my back, I don't know what to do with my back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some people are getting a lot of me. pass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay too. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think, you know, I would, you know, maybe there's ways that we can, you know, and I think also there's always those practical challenges of, you know, what do you do when you're in a proscenium theater and, and you know, you know, how, maybe there's ways of bringing people up onto the stage and, you know, lots to be, I think there will be, you know, different morphs of the piece, but I think that, I think that circle really resonated with us and, and 
you know, the, in the beginning, uh -huh. the dancers, you know, uh, members of Urban Bushwoman and Tatiana, who works with Camille Brown and a wonderful dancer, Rocker James. Like we started with kind of creating the feeling of an old school juke joint. And, you know, we were setting up a story about Louis Armstrong and the dancers all just come from the audience and do these explosive solos in the center. It's like a New Orleans groove. <laughs> and that really felt like, it just felt like, okay, we're starting to create the world here. And, and we're showing, <laughs> we're giving a sense yeah. of what liberation can feel like. Um, and so I think that, you know, that, and, and that we, you know, so we want, we, that's important to the piece. And like, we're, we're gonna keep yeah. finding that. We're gonna keep finding that. Yeah, do you, I mean, so I guess two things is, uh, uh, are, are you making a piece that can, um, be viewed from any angle uh, or perform, be performed in any theater or, you know, I mean, do you see an outdoor uh, performance in an arena at some point or, Absolutely. you know, as well as a black box, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think we want to do this, be able to do this piece in, in many forms as a concert, as a, you know, in a festival environment. You know, there's all these cannabis festivals around the country and um, yeah. I, I, I went and scoped out of a few of them. I mean, there's ones in California where there's 25,000 people and, and there's bands and there's music and there's talks and there's presentations and there's cannabis contests. And so, you know, we wanna, we wanna, we wanna bring this show to those kinds of environments right. as well yeah. as theaters and outdoor places. And, um, you know, so I think, I think that it will, we will create it in a way that's flexible. Um, you know, we also wanna have uh, talks and like we, you know, after that, clip you just saw, then we brought up, a, we had a, a panel discussion afterwards and we brought up this wonderful activist, Leo Bridgewater, who's a, um, a veteran and you know a cannabis advocate. And then we had a great dialogue and then he was able to really talk about that song. And you know, it, it was amazing to hear from him how he really felt like that piece sort of brought his story onto the stage. And so I think, you know, we imagine, we'd love the show to sit sort of in, front, in a festival environment, you know, where there's the piece, but then there's local artists that get woven in um, you know, there's, you know, we, we want to find ways to honor local cannabis activists in each place that we travel to. Yes. And, so, and maybe even have like a community choir, you know, where we like create a song. Grace is one of the best people I've ever seen be able to make a song with a group of people in like an hour, you know, <laughs> you know, that sounds like it's been written over months. So, you know, I'm, I'm imagining we go into a town, we, we workshop with a local activist group, we create like a song celebrating a local activist. Right. And then, and then at some point, because then the, yeah. then the art isn't just the art, isn't just the show, the art exactly. is the whole process. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. The community that you're creating while you make it. Yeah. 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 And we that got a need, and we got the we got the need for grant. We got the need for grant. <laughs> oh, congratulations! It's so helpful. It's oh my god. <laughs> and also, we should maybe say a couple things about here in terms of like oh. the, the process. That here, at being a harp artist has allowed you to have these workshops to figure out what do we want them? Do we want to have a runway? Do we want it in the round? Right. Do we, you know, so um, I, I, I guess got, maybe talk about that. Yeah, let's 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 be clear. We have to give praise to here because here has been. I mean, as you know, you know the whole team there. They are just the real deal. They are the real yeah. deal. They showed up for us in both Grace in and I. In the pandemic, oh my gosh, <laughs> they showed up up front for us in a way that I cannot describe. I don't think anyone, any community, has sincerely supported me in a time of adversity in the way that here has, and that was after I, going to the school for fifteen years. Oh yes, Baba, please tell the tell oh, them. My, this. I mean, but Grace and I both had COVID in March, and oh, wow. uh, it was very intense. And it took me out for oh, like three weeks, and it was kind of got a little scary there at one point. And we need, you know, we were living with my mother, and we had to isolate. Here helped us find an apartment so we could quarantine. They helped me apply for SBA loans. They helped us get all kinds of emergency grants. I mean, they just. They were they helped they helped pivot the organization so that they could support artists to create online content when they were all the work disappeared, you know they they just they just really showed up and you know were proactively calling like on a weekly basis how are you how's it going what can we do to help, um, it really is a phenomenal it it really is a community experience and there's also so much support to experiment you know to do these to do a lot of iterations and works in progress and try things and do things well and mess things up and, you know, try things and also do, do works in progress in different venues. They supported us doing, you know, a work in progress in a nightclub. You right. know, <laughs> Everyone um, <laughs> came through. I was so surprised. <laughs> you know, and the whole team showed up to a nightclub and we like did a great set, you know, work in progress set at, at New Blue on the Lower East Side. And, 
you know, what theater like supports a work in progress in a nightclub? Like it just. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. But they know, all should be. <laughs> they should be, absolutely. You know, and so I think it's just, it's, and then, you know, the, the community at, at here has also been, you know, you know, people, artists like Mia Witherspoon and, you know, other folks, uh, you know, you know, that we've, that. Mia uh, is amazing. She's that's amazing. The, that's yeah, the so, woman. Yeah, so, you know, her and Imani Azuri, <laughs> who's coming back into the fold with us and, you know, it's just been great to have uh, folks to bounce off. Uh, Gisela, who we love, who's, you know, just so many artists and yes, our, our, fellow har our, fel our fellow yeah. harpies. Um, Gelsey, who's a newer, a newer member of our team. So it's just, yeah, it just, it feels like a real community and uh, a, oh, a space where, where you're supported to, you know, and, and also like, you know, some days I would just go into the office in a panic and just like meet with each team and like leave, you know, breathing steadily, you know? Uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Christian, uh, uh, I won't go on too much about my own stuff, but Christian was the, one of the only, um, well, really, Mark Russell and Christian were the only two artistic directors in the entire city who would come and see like my little show in an off, 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 off Broadway, not off Broadway. It wasn't, it was a bar, a, a gay based bar. <laughs> You know, and they were the ones that like braved it to come see it, you know, to see the show. And, and I mean, I wouldn't have a career if it weren't for Kristen Martin. So <laughs> I love that woman. All praises to <laughs> All love to her and the whole crew. Um, I think that we, I think we've gone over our talk. Yeah, that's uh, good. Yeah, so we did. Do you guys have anything else you want to say or any, any, any hope or any, um, anything you need from the larger community to make this happen? I just oh, want to say thank you, Taylor, for your time and for asking us questions that really opened up a wonderful conversation and gave us insight. And um, oh, okay. this is a great place to just sort of give our praise to hear and acknowledgement of what they've done for us and what they've done for this project. So we're so glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I would say that, you know, just thank you as well for, you know, you know, being, uh, you know, being a role model as an artist who is like, you know, really honors your truth and creates spaces of liberation and, and transcendence and just has, has helped to break open the, the theater world, you know, for people who come from different contexts, you know, and we don't come from the, the same context that you, but we, re we really relate to you and your, and your intentions as an artist. And, so thank you for breaking open space and expanding thank what people can imagine. Yeah, you know, we really appreciate that. And then, you know, we'd love to at some point have a, another meeting with you because we'd love to bounce some of our audience interaction thoughts with you. Oh, sure. You're, 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 you, we, <laughs> sure. You know, I really, I really respect yeah. the way, I, I really, know. I don't know, I really respect <laughs> the way you approach that and the way you are really <laughs> playful, but very political at the same time um, and irreverent, but reverent. Um, and so I think that that you balance those things in a beautiful way, and we'd love to at some point have a follow up conversation with you. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Anytime. All right. Great. Thank you all very much, and um, thanks to HowlRound, and bye. bye. I can't wait to see it. I really can't wait to see it. <laughs>